asked for a job teaching anywhere. Got the short of wanted me to go to New England, and uh, people just found out from the pupils that I've had. I suppose if you love a thing, and uh, you're very serious about it, and you're very fortunate, and you're musical yourself, then it makes it easy to be a good teacher. I, I went to Boston to take my clarinet lesson from Hamlin, the solo clarinet of the Boston Symphony. And uh, I went there early because somebody had told me that Whiteman was there, and the lead saxophonist was just wonderful. That turned out to be Chet Hazlitt. And so I went backstage after the performance and knocked on the door on the stage hand and said, what do you want, kid? I said, I'd like to congratulate the saxophone soloist. He says, hey, Chet, some kid wants to see you. So Chet came out, and I had a double clarinet case because I was studying with Hamlet. He said, hey, he said, isn't that a double clarinet case? I said, yeah. He said, do you have any excerpts? I said, I have all those Strauss things. He said, yeah, I remember those. Come on in. Let's play some duets. So I went in, and I met every one of the white, all the guys in the white men's band. And Chet told me, he said, Joe, he said, if you ever get to New York, or from New Jersey, and not right over the George Washington Bridge. Give me a buzz, I'd be, I'd be delighted to see you. And so he, he there was Don Voorhees did a, a musical comedy. There was an English musical comedy. Between the Devil was the name of it. And I played first clarinet in the pit with that thing, you know. And uh, Don liked me because I played saxophone, I played bass clarinet, and I played clarinet. Oh, all of them. Yeah, in the show. And that's how I got to meet Don. Now he got the Bell Telephone show. But he had always been using Chet. But Chet also played with the Castellanis outfit. Now that was conflicting. So he decided that he'd stay with the one where he'd been the longest, and then recommended me to play with Don. And Don says, yeah, but Joe's a kid. He said, I think you'll crack up. He said, no, I know Joe. He won't crack up. And here, we've got Mignon over the dolly, 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 one of those things. And boy, I had a pressure from here to here that was so extreme. I'd never had it before. And when I got through, I didn't even know whether I played it or not. But the conductor looked all right, so I said, well, I must have played it. <laughs> and from then on, now on the program, you'd have Fritz Chrysler, you'd have, oh, just you name them, the greatest, the greatest singers, vocalists, or whatever you want to say, and the greatest instrumentalists, piano and uh, Heifetz and uh, on violin and all kinds of things like that. It was really, really very, very, very dramatic. But the difference was that I loved symphonic works and the people who played and before I, they were all fired simply because they didn't even bother to read the score. Mm. And Toscanini wouldn't stand for that. He was really bright as a button. So you studied the score? Sure, I studied the score from 8 o'clock at night until about 3 the next morning, you know, so that I knew who was coming, you know, what was going on before, and what was coming on after, and so on and on and on. And I took it much, much more seriously. Now, every one of those fellows who was fired was a good guy, but so what they, they, hadn't pra they hadn't looked at the score or anything. Yeah. But when it finally came time to recording it, how did that go? Well, it went down very well. He never, said, he never said boo. Huh? Was he prone to uh, say boo? Well, he, 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 did, he said something uh, like this to the, uh, the first cellist or the first violinist, or violinist or something after I played it, you know? And uh, what, what he said was, non c'è male. Non c'è male, which means not bad, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> so my first solo with the NBC Symphony with this committee was not bad, not bad. <laughs> That's quite a compliment. Yeah. And how I got that job really was very funny. There was a, Bellison was a solo clarinetist in the New York Philharmonic, German clarinetist who played with the German Reed German mouthpiece. And uh, he had good cane, and he started making the reeds that would fit for the regular French clarinetists, you know. 
And uh, this one guy had this radio, I mean, this reed thing, but he, he had to pay alimony, and he had to go to alimony court, and he had a date at NBC. He said, Joe, he says, I don't dare tell him that I can't do it. He said, if I don't do it, I'll go to jail. <laughs> he said, will you do it for me? He said, I can't pay you, but I'll get you some reeds. <laughs> I said, sure. So I went and he said, hey, kid, what are you doing here? I says, I'm doing here because I was sent here. He said, did you ever play Grand Canyon Suite? I said, no, but I practiced it. Oh, he almost went into a tantrum, you know, and I played it. And when we played, he says, kid, you should tell him once to get a substitute. You can do it, you know. And uh, from then on, I started to do some dates at the NBC when somebody couldn't make it. That's how it started. Start substituting. But then the first thing you know, I got so that they wanted me instead of the one I was substituting for, which was perfectly all right with me. Now, what, about, what was I supposed to do? Say, sorry, I'm only a, a substitute. I don't want to take this job, something like that. But if you don't do it, we'll get somebody else to do it. And in Boston, when Red Nichols came to town, his lead alto man, lead clarinet man, it was a big band then, a small band within the big one, and uh, he had come in poisoning. So he called New York to get Eddie Powell to come to York. He said, I, I'm just start, I just started the, the uh, not the Bull Telephone, this other radio show anyway. It was a very famous one. And he says, I can't do it because I'm doing this thing. He said, but you don't need to get anybody in New York. He said, call this kid in Lowell Mass, Joe Allen. So it was about, oh my gosh, um, after midnight, almost one o'clock in the morning, the phone rang and I went to her. He says, may I speak with Joe Allen? She said, you mean the father or my son? He said, well, not the father. He does he play clarinet? <laughs> well, you mean my son. And uh, so he said, Joe, he says, if you'll take a plane, he said, my manager will be there to make sure that everything's okay because we'll pick you up in Detroit. So I went, that's where we started from. You know, we just barnstormed all over the place that whole summer. And then we got, when we got back to New York, he wouldn't, he said, Joe, now we're going to be on location in Chicago. He says, I'd love to have you, but he says, it's not going to be good for you. He says, this is where you're going to do well. I know New York. And there's a lot of what you've got we're looking for. There's only one, and that's Chet Hazlitt. And Chet Hazlitt can't do it all. And Chet and you are very dear friends. So it worked out fine. Yeah, because, and especially with the Bell Telephone show, that conflicted with Castellanet show. And he said to Don, he says, you know, Don, I've been, I was with the Castellanet show before I played for you. He said, I understand. And he said, but I think the Joe's going to crack up. He's too young. And I had a pressure from here that was yeah. intense. I didn't know whether I'd played it. <laughs> you know, what when I got through, so I said to the flutist, who was the first flutist, Johnny Woman in the Philharmonic, I said, did I play that thing? He said, yeah, you did a damn good job of it, too, Joe. <laughs> How do you deal with the pressure of performing when you've got to do... Well, by the time exactly the first right. note comes out, you're, cons you know, you're, 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 you're hearing the, whole, the thing as a whole, more or less. You know, once you've practiced it about 150 times, right, you could, and I did it in about four, four or five different keys, and by the time it came well, to that... You know, it to yeah, different keys, yeah, too. Yeah. So it's very important to pre-hear that phrase. Oh, absolutely. If you don't pre-hear it, it's not going to be any good. Yeah. It's going to be very, very mechanical. I studied with Dufresne, the first bassist in, in the Boston Symphony, who had got the highest honors at the Paris Conservatory. And uh, in the beginning, he just started, you know, boom, 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 all right, now. He says, now sing it all. La, la, do, si, la, so, fa, mi, re, do. Oh, so he said, now, play the do. All right, now, do it again, but don't play it. But when you get to sing the last note, play the, the note on the piano. 
and I was a little bit high. I said, don't worry about that. That's all right. He says, it took you some time to get a good tone on your instrument. He says, if you need to use your voice, if you're not used to doing it, he says, it's just going to be strange. But he says, what you hear in your head will dictate some miracle that takes place in here. He says, don't worry about it. You'll do it. Do it again. Boom. First thing I know, I started singing everything that I saw I wanted to sing. And that's what a lot of musicians don't do. They think about breathing, they think about the throat, they think about the embouchure and the chin and so on. And where's the music? There's none. And the best thing that I ever learned was from Hamlin. And it was this. You put the ball right around your knees, and you put your hand like this, and put your thumbs under the jawbone, and then your fingers here to stop this. See, that chokes it. It chokes off the sides of the reed, you know? And the reed has to vibrate in a straight line, but that makes it a curved Curve. line, and it's choked. So then, what I had to do for Hamlin was my, th my thumbs under the jawbone, and the fingers here to stop that lip, and then gradually take the fingers away and let you get, and hopefully, you get the same result. So, the first thing I did was, that's very easy to do. And they say, equal pressure all around the reed and mouthpiece so that you don't, air does not escape. But the, the French people never said anything about the air escaping. They bother them. No, because if you did this enough, if it, I'll let it leak this time. I practiced it. Now open the left side, open the right side, open the middle, and then feel that you're not going to do it at all. But you're not going to try for it to come down either. It just is a receiving body, you know, so. You know, you can't do it as well when you're doing this because there's tension there, you know? Tension gives you bad tone? Sure. Here. It chokes it all off. And you get a real, almost have a cramp in your stomach or something, you know? So this exercise helped you hear oh, very, very that much. tone. Now, there's no change in the tone quality when you... But when I first did it, I did it. And that's what everybody does when they first they tighten up. Yeah, because the they tell you, tighten the corners, make sure that no air escapes. Well, if there's no air escapes, you can't even talk either. You know, so you could take your, your finger and really flip this. And there would be no no tension. Just put the finger. Take your little finger. Okay. Well, this way though. Okay. The little finger, more gentle. <laughs> and then get yeah. Yeah. All right. Now I'll play a high note too. It's very relaxed. Yeah. So there's just enough so that if you take a look at it, uh, what the hell do? I was shocked when I, I did this in the mirror. I played this so much, like here, and unknown to me, and I was too close, this just by itself almost to do it. You know? Look. She said, I purposely did this. Leak here, leak here, leak there. And then don't bother to leak. But it's not, it's not a part of tension because it chokes you. Mm. All right. Now, what the, the average is, tighten the corners. Uh, well, what happens to my voice when I do this? First of all, if you want to help me with this, my voice is very nasal. It's going to be the same thing with the instrument, too. So, uh, 
So if it doesn't work for the voice, this is the voice. Just an extension of your it's voice. It's an extension huh? of your voice, sure. So that there is overtones at the other. For instance, you go on a clarinet, it does not play the octave. It plays the octave and the fifth. And so on. There it does give you a fifth. So you can go. Tones of each fundamental. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good idea because it gives you, you have to use your ear. There's no way that you can get the note if you don't hear it. You have it. to pre imagine that. Touch. Absolutely, you pre hear it. Pre hear it. Mm -hmm. And then your body does something. Sure, something you happens reach. in here. Everything happens at the larynx and at the reed. But so you'll never know to. what it feels like at the larynx. That's below the threshold of conscious feeling. You'll never know what it is, what so it feels like. But you know it. you can get the result. Once you get the result, then you know you've got it. Now, the only way you can get the result is by training. Your ear dictates to this laryngeal area. But you'll never know what in the world it feels like. It's not like I'm going to close my finger now. Yeah. Yeah. So that I can do that on quite a few different notes. You can play, that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. With seven different fingerings, and I can still hang on to that thing. No, because this is so very, very important. Just a combination of your memory yeah. and mm -hmm. your, your ability to hear that, sure. that tone. Yeah. And if you read all the articles and everything, they talk about open throat. Well, naturally, an open throat, that's, that's not what it is at all. You don't know you have a throat. When you have a sore throat, you know you've got one. And when the soreness has disappeared, what happens to the throat? You don't know you have it. So actually, when you're playing your horn, you don't know you have a throat. Yeah. What the lip does, it absorbs the excessive overtones. That's all it does. All it does is covers the reed. It does not try to put a pressure on there. It's the chewing that does everything. So. So you can have a lot of fun with this, and you can do the same thing on the alto. Now, brass men play an awful lot on their mouthpieces. Really? They practice? Sure. They just play with just the mouthpiece. Yeah. You have an opening, and as you put a pressure, what happens to the opening? Diminishes. Of right. And it's the same thing as they do. But now, when I had the mouthpiece here, I could do it. See, because it, there was the other one. Or here. Here. So you can get several. I can't do it very well with my fingers, but if you have this limb here and the limb here, it gives the muscles in this area whatever it needs so that this can buzz very easily. But then the minute you do it like this, you can't do it at all. So there's a great relation. And that's the reason why I started playing the scale on this mouthpiece. The brass people do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bass clarinet. Yeah, now the clarinet would the saxophone would be. The alto? Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, you can play the bass set, you can play the dominant set, and you can play an augmented set, and you can just just have a lot of fun with it. You know. You don't and drive you, your neighbor is crazy. Well, that's true. <laughs> At the end, I started to get kind of knocked out a little bit. But All the chords, you can play an augmented chord, a major chord, a diminished chord, or something like that. Mm -hmm. The crescendo that you just did mm -hmm. a little while ago did. You have to move along here. So you slide you have to put, yeah. into your. So you just slide it like this, watch it. Try it in a side profile. Now, Tabitha used to say to strive to get 20, de 20 degrees of variety of intensities. Uh, loudness, amplitude. Yeah. So I'm going to try and get from the, the loudest one, which would be the highest one. Uh, Quite a, quite a little trick to do. It's not easy. When you do that crescendo, is that the same thing that you do when the mouthpiece is on the horn? Well, it makes it a whole lot easier, but I do the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Whoop. Whereas if you try to play it that softly here, you can't. But the idea is that the embouchure is not just hurt or hurt, no. Well, you can't say the alphabet like that, A-I-O-U. It's like A-I-O-U. You know, if you paralyze your lips, you just can't say A-I-O-U. So the, the embouchure isn't paralyzed. The flexibility seems to be well, Of course, because you've got an accent, what are you going to do? When you normally play, though, you don't always project your jaw. It's only when you need an accent that yeah. you're playing an accent. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think, are there some uh, overtone exercises that are good on, on clarinet and saxophone that you well, could show us? Yeah, sure. Let's say, shall we do, well, I'll do the saxophone? Do the sax first? I accidentally fingered low F one day after I had taken the flute lesson. I was playing at the Mount Washington Hotel with just a flute clarinet, and I played saxophone only when they had dancing, which was when the old folks had their grandchildren come with their friends, you know, and they had raised holy hell. And before, when they were not there, it was just like a morgue, you know. And uh, so in, in the, there was this flutist, Harry Moscovich, who had played with the St. Louis Symphony, and he had a golden, solid gold flute. So uh, one day I said to Harry, I said, Harry, I'd, we've got plenty of time in between, you know, playing at the big house. And I said, uh, I'd like to take some flute lessons. He said, do you have a flute? I said, no. He said, how can I give you lessons if you don't have a flute? I said, what the heck? Let me play your flute. <laughs> I never did that before, Joe. I don't like doing it. It's a cold I said, well, I'd appreciate it, you know. So he said, all right, now, he said, this is low F. I like a saxophone. When you play low F, you put the octave key on, it gives you an octave. 
I mean, a flute, you can't do that. You just have to direct the air. You know, you push your lip further upon that opening until it goes from large to small, and it'll come. So, so I had some fun with this. Now, I don't know, a few days later, I picked up my horn and just fingered low F, not thinking about the flute at all. And I'll be darned, I got middle F. I didn't have my finger on the octave key. I said, I'll be down. So then I started like this. Key. Well, without the octave key. And then I did that until it was uh, just a lot of fun. And it gave you a good feeling about what to do with that particular note, you know? So, in other words, if I go from here. Now, if I depend on that octave key, I'm just going to go. There's no intensity there. Whereas the other way, without the octave key, so it's good for you on an altar to do it because there's much more projection, there's a greater intensity. Because you, th you think, ah, the octave key gives you something. Yes, what is it? It's a leak key. It causes a leak. But now sometimes that leak is too much. And if you've got imagination, you'll use it. But when you know how to play it without using the register key, then when you use the register key, it's never going to fall. But you'll know how to get that intensity. So you don't depend on the register key. Right, right. Now, for instance, like here. The first time that I experimented with the overtones on the saxophone, I'd never done it until I did it with the flute. And then I had to do it on the clarinet, and the clarinet is a, an entirely different field. First of all, you can't get an octave because the clarinet's built on an octave and a fifth. But once you do it on the clarinet, it's it's it's, it's really very interesting too. There you go. You can go. I haven't done this in a long, long time. Now, can you go similarly through the, the overtone series of a saxophone? Sure. This is a twelfth, but now the saxophone right. is built in an octave, so it's a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. Now, the F is an overtone of low B flat. So here's B flat. Mm -hmm. So it's all what you hear. It's amazing what this little rascally thing doesn't you and you'll never know what it feels like. I can sing it. No, I have to breathe in to do that. And that's all in here, and it's the same thing, except here you hear the result. Here you hear the result. But you have to hear it, because if you don't hear it, my gosh, it's you're impossible. Lost. You're lost. Sure. It's quite uh, a discipline to do that. 
How long did yeah. it take you to do that? Oh, I don't I never cared how long a thing takes, as long as you do it. You know, if you stop worrying about how long it's going to take you to do it, then you'll never do it. If, you say, if it's going to take you two weeks, it's going to take you two minutes, it's going to take you a half hour. You just monkey around with it, but don't let it get you. And don't be disappointed if it doesn't come out. Just say, oh, all right, I'm going to relax. Put it down and pick it up, slide it again, you know? Yeah. Joe, could you um, show us how you prepare a read? When it comes right out of the box, what is it that you do to it before I you just put it on the horn? Read it and make sure that the, the edge is not corrugated, because then, if it is, once the, the one that's nearer to the facing would shut, and the other would stay open and split your read. Really? Yes. So you keep moistening it, and what if it well, doesn't quite curve, uh, well, like a flat on you? Then, like in this particular case, I'm just going to try... Unless you slide that in, too. Yeah, you slide it this way because if you put it like this, one of my teachers was playing the Mozart clarinet concerto with the symphony orchestra in uh, Zurich. And he was a little bit nervous because he was playing the, the Mozart clarinet concerto. It was a long introduction to the orchestra. And he was nervous, and so he took the, took the reed and the ligature off. And he went like this and broke the reed. Right before he had to play. Before he had to play. Then he had to, he had to walk off the stage, and the orchestra had to repeat the introduction. And when he came, now he would never let you put the reed on the mouthpiece like this because of his experience. So show the proper way. Yeah. Well, now see here, this isn't going to do the reed any harm. So you're going like this, and then you adjust it to where it is going to be and you'll never hurt the reed with the ligature. So this is a brand new reed out of the That's box. It's a brand new reed out of the box. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put, I'm going to vibrate this reed with the space shut here, vibrating this side. And then I'm going to shut this one, vibrating that, so that it'll tell me which of the two sides is harder than the other. Gotcha. So now we're going to put the pressure on the right side of the reed. On the left, they're both too hard. Too hard. So now, do you have a pencil? A uh, pencil. Well, I'm not going to go any further than the sixteenth of an inch along the reed. Now, for instance, what I would, what I could do would be. This is a guide for you to help yeah, you. Yeah, for you, not for me. Yeah. And then I would do it. And then uh, I don't do it this way because it doesn't do it quite as nicely. Your angle. So that, yeah. It's quite a sharp little knife you got there. And always make sure that your finger's under this because if you go like this, it breaks the meat. Yeah. And you try a lot. That's just that, doesn't that sound a whole lot easier than before? But it's still not enough. Mm -hmm. I see that's practically all gone now. All the pencil light is gone. Yeah, but it's reed that I'm shaving off. I'm, in other words, I'm thinning this side of the I know you stay, stay away from the center. Yes, because I, I want that in the center. It's the heart. Yeah. I see the right is fine, but the left does not vibrate well. So, now we we'll do what we did. Should the reed, when you place it on, uh, be right at the tip of the mouth? Well, see, as it is now, it's not curved. But when you do this... When you press it down so that it's closed... Well, so you have to press it down. Now, there's a tiny, tiny bit of the... This is, oh, nothing but 
a very, very narrow thing, which is the way it should be anyway. But in this particular case, I would say... So you press the reed down. Yeah. Now, the right, this, I like the way the left goes. Now, I've got to take some wood out of the right because it doesn't give me what I want. Now, I'll shut the right and vibrate the left. That's the double high C. So if I had taken too much on, of the, if I had taken, instead of here, taken it in here, the thing would shut and I would lose all the highs. This way here, I've retained the highs. But now I can play whispery if I need, and I still can shout. Now you get the entire, from the lowest note to the highest note that's ever used. And that high C is very seldom used, except in practice. Is there anything that you do to the lay side of the reed, the side of the reed that's facing the mouthpiece, that fits on the flat surface of the mouthpiece? Well, when the reed, I play it as it is now. And all of a sudden, it doesn't play well. All right. I mean, you've been playing it, say, a couple days? Or... Oh, no, not that much. No, no, for about 15, 10 minutes. It okay. doesn't play well. Then when you see it, this is all saturated with moisture. And when it's on your facing right in here, it's going to cause it to leak. So what you do is you take this piece of paper right on both sides. One time I didn't have it. No way. And I did it, and you know that the pressure like this. I put my fourth finger here and the middle one here and I go through like this with a lot of pressure. You will take those swollen fibers and push them right back so that it's the fibers and the spaces are just perfectly flat. You take a flat piece of glass or yep, well, window, window pane. Window pane. But this happens to be here so it's easier. See how smooth that is now. Very smooth. So all the fibers get mashed in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that helps it fit on the, the lay of the mouthpiece better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sometimes my lip, lower lip gets cut from yeah. playing. Yeah. What can I do about that? Yeah, well, let me see. Yeah, this definitely, right here, you have a real sharp point. Okay, now, at the very point right there, it's sharp as a knife. And when he's putting that, and his teeth are pushing that lip in there, it's going to really hurt the lip. Uh -huh. So the best thing to do is to take a little sandboard like this. So you're getting the lower teeth in a flat plane. Well, see, between this tooth and this one, this has a little bit of a peak. And boy, that hurts. You put your lip over your teeth and play. And see what the feeling is as your teeth push your lip into the reef. Much more comfortable. Is there something that uh, a player can do if they're going to play a long amount of time uh, to minimize the cutting into their lip? And I've got it set, yes. down. You take well, that sandpaper, which I did for years, 
And the Boston Symphony people never played a note unless they you put take that a cigarette paper. I guess it's, it's, this was done way before the days of pop. Now, as you go into a drugstore and you want to buy the, the, the paper, they don't give a damn, but they sort of kind of give you a dirty look. And one time I was given a dirty look, and I said, listen, you've got a big mouth in your eyes. I said, well, you think that I'm going to smoke pot? And if I did, it would be none of your damn stinking business. And you cannot stop me from buying this paper that I have in so my what, hand. So what do we do with this paper now? Well, you fold just it? fold it up, yeah. I mean, that gives you a very good... I will do it on the outside yeah, first. It doesn't matter. But Did you say that there was um, some of your classical music colleagues that had a metallic element that they put over their two yes, bottom teeth? Yes. Uh, uh, Defaye, who's the greatest concert saxophone player I've ever heard, even better than this teacher, Muir. He's a genius. He was a genius at five on the violin. He's extremely musical. And he plays with a, a cover over Oh, his yes. Well, he got that from me. And it's something that a dental technician will do for you. And I played first clarinet at the Bell Telephone radio shows. And I played first clarinet in the Band of America. I got stuck with all the solos. And the three days after I had this in, and I told the conductor, I said, uh, Paula, well, I said, Paula, I said, you know, I just had that surgery. He said, ah, oh, Joe, there's nothing to play, come on. And there was a clarinet and he said, ah, nothing to play. And I asked the other guys to play, he said, oh, no, Joe, no, 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 no. I can't play that like you can, you know. And I almost had tears running down my, my eyes because I was scared. But it came out very, very well. And when I was right, I do this. And it just barely touches the top teeth. And I've been able to get along all these years. So by necessity, you don't push down on the top mm -mm. with your teeth. You don't so rest your mouth. And this firmly. is a receiving. That upper body of teeth is only meant to receive the force generated by the lower set of teeth. And it's in your chewing muscle. Mm -hmm. And you can do that all day long. It will never hurt the teeth. And if you do this, you really hurt yourself. You what is the lip doing when you... The lip absorbs the excessive overtones. You could play with your teeth, but it'd be horrible. Here it is with the teeth. But at least I got that much. That's teeth on it. Now, the teeth, that would be just like a wooden hammer without a felt striking the piano wires. You would have so many overtones that you wouldn't be able to tell what the pitch is. So you have a strong upward pressure. Right, strong enough. You can't, you can't play with the reed space open. You can't play with it closed. So somewhere between open and closed in your ear is the thing that's going to tell. In piano, the hammers which strike against the piano wires are covered with felt. Now, the purpose of the soft body of felt is to absorb the excessive overtones. So, if I put my teeth on the reed and the teeth on the mouthpiece, which would be just like playing with a wooden hammer striking the piano wires. You'd have too many overtones. So here it is, here, here. Very harsh. Now, which one sounds more? No question. Yeah. So, all the lip does, does not exert. The lip cannot exert. It's not tight here? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. no. If you hear, the chin is wrinkled. Now, the chin won't be like the books will tell you. Tight in the corner. No, you're tight in the corner, which is what the horse sounds like. Whereas, if you do, 
And she goes, hey, she's got a lot of lip on that reed, and it feels great. And you, you can verbalize, you can express all kinds of emotions. Well, if you look at this, you just can't. Because it's all too nasal. Too many highs, not enough lows. Because these things are based upon no values. And Ortega Higa said, said, a man's feelings can be wrong. But when we learn, they were based on poor, no values or poor values. And this great philosopher was a, it was a, it's a good thing that so I read it. Intuition can be wrong. Mm -hmm. And a right. student has to unlearn some things. Sure. sure. So it's a equal pressure all around the reading mouthpiece. If you took a string and did this, what would happen to the size of the reed? Tight. It would be curved. Curve. And then you wouldn't be vibrating the reed properly at all. Is that what causes squeaking? Well, it can cause anything. Sure. It can cause the squeaking. Yeah. I would say 99%, 99 out of 100, the reason for that would be cutting corners. And then you and then you really have to work hard. So here's Titan Car. It, it just doesn't do it. We're right here. And do this, how do this? Then what do we do here? There's not much pressure there at all. There shouldn't be. The pressure belongs right there in the middle of that reed. Can you take your upper teeth off the mouthpiece and play? Sure. Of course, it's just better to do that. too much wiggling the other way. So it's you a, a receptacle for the mouthpiece, no. but you don't put downward no. pressure no. on the because mouthpiece. If you put what a downward pressure, what's going to happen in here? Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. tightens. Sure, tightens, it closes, because nature says, hey, cut that out. That's a warning to you. The minute you go, ah, it's a, ah, it's a bad feeling. The worst thing in the world to try and use your top teeth to exert instead of what? That's like chewing. Be, definitely. Mm -hmm. I also notice that your upper part of your head, your skull, does, oh, not, do does not move when you take a breath. No, that's right. You should stay still. Yeah. So the, the best way to take your breath is really. It's a great, great effort. It's not logical. Where is your tongue when you put the mouth? The tongue is an extension of the reed. Huh. How so? Well, let's say here is the reed, right? And the tongue is here. Mm -hmm. Now, now the front edge of the tongue goes where? At the floor of the mouth. See, right now, just relax. All right, now, in this inactive position, the most natural thing for the front edge of your tongue is to be beneath your lower front teeth and to touch the gum. This is the cable tie and try to talk. I can't talk because it's, it's not a thing. It's, it's the in, uh, what was it? Inarticulate? Uh, yeah, well, it's, a, you know, it's the inarticulate position. But it's the natural position when you just simply have nothing to say. Quartz, who died in 1706 or something like that, wrote an article and he played all the instruments in the orchestra from the piano, the organ, the oboe, the bassoon, the trumpet, the trombone, the tuba, and he was a genius, and the composer. And he said, in flute, the position of the tongue is as if you were saying, 
Where are the sides of your tongue? Are anchored firmly against the sides of the back teeth. Yeah, it's a little bit too far. You want to try the, the yeah, candle? Well, I'd rather do it with, yeah, here. Yeah. Although he doesn't have much hair there. No, you can't do it. I could do it with him. You hold the camera. Let's do, do it here. Yeah, let's do it with the candle. Well, it's, yeah. Let's try it the, the inarticulate way. Now, there's a lot of noise there, right? That's open throat. <laughs> you don't play with an open throat. You don't know you have a throat. The only time you know you have a throat is when it's sore. And when the infection goes away, what happens in the throat? No the last fish. So now, P, P, T. So you want to move that reed. Now, this is called the tongue of the soprano. So therefore, it's logical. If I play it like this, this is ridiculous because it's got to go like that. Whereas here, where at here, Here. There's sufficient airspeed to yeah. cause the... Yeah. And the, the opening vibrate. here is very, very small. Very small. It's yeah. a millimeter. And now, thick. you don't feel anything. So I'm going to go... Moise wrote this beginner's first flute exercises, you know? And he has middle C, half note, half rest, B, half note, down to low C. And when you take your breath, you drop the jaw. Now, it's the same thing, even though this isn't the flu, but you're not going to go, oh, oh. You've got to find the read all over again. Oh, I've seen people breathe through the sides of their mouth. Uh, uh, no. Now that feels just like speaking. Ba, 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 ba. I'm not doing anything with my tongue, it's just a job. A, E, I, O, O. You're not doing anything with the, strange with the tongue at all. And if I move the tongue, mm, I'm all choked up. O, A, O. And then you drop that tongue, where's it go? It's just, the larynx is very clever. It knows how to protect itself. And so it's going to do something, just to close it up, just because it's trying to give you protection. And when I took my first lesson from Hamlet, he said, Alors, vous êtes français? Quand j'ai dit, tu vous comprenez? In other words, Alors, you are French speaking. When I say, tu, you can say, tu, just like I can. But the Americans come, I say, tu, and they say, tu, what can I do? <laughs> so it was kind of, now as a kid, boy, I was so proud of the very fact that I, my first language was French because I thought I was going to play better clan. <laughs> so I can touch right here, that's one. I can touch at the edge of the reed, that's two. And I can touch under the edge of the reed, that's three. So here. At the edge. If you want to do dip, dip, dip. That's 
under the... Then you just shut that reed very tightly. But if you're just going to do it very, very lightly, you can tongue between the reed and mouthpiece. Is that useful musically? Now I'll touch the air. Mid-riff. Mid-riff is getting smaller. What was that last? Well, because you've got to get rid of the carbon dioxide. That's the bad air yeah. in your no, lungs. No, it's not bad air. It's carbon dioxide. There's a certain small amount of carbon dioxide. And if you don't get rid of it, it ends up by taking up more space in the ribs and lungs than otherwise. Than you would need, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there some good exercises for a wind player or, or a singer to do? Absolutely. Can you show us what, what sure. those are? Yeah, sure. I'll... Oh. This way? This way. All right. Yeah. I'll bring the, he the heels. Well, some people are not quite as slender as I, for instance. But I bring my heels to touch my buttocks. And then oh. get my heels off. And my ribs are now raised. And so the only thing is, the diaphragm will function. This is yeah. raised. So that the exhaling is really, let's say the, the, the ribs are capable of one third of the breath and the diaphragm two thirds, but you can't feel the diaphragm. You can feel the effect of the muscles going this way. So it exerts a pressure on the first part of the abdomen, which puts the pressure on two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, so on and on. That's how it functions, you know. Now, there's a woman doctor who got involved in a process of studying with the best of the vocalists in Europe and the United States to make a report about the breathing. And she said that it seems that the diaphragm has dramatic appeal. Whereas the diaphragm is responsible for two-thirds of the breath, the ribs run. So if all the strokes I let him go. So it's one-third the ribs and two-thirds the diaphragm, and it's the most logical and anatomically it's sound. She and it, if you do the exercise, it's so painless, you know, that you get in the habit of doing this, and the first thing you know when you get up, it feels so... It's a groovy feeling, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, are there some aspects of fingering <coughs> that a student should know about? Fingering of a wing? Well, that your fingers should not do this. Should come now off. when you get, yeah, they shouldn't get off the pearls. And that's tricky. So you have to just do an exercise like this until your finger does not get off the pearl. <laughs> to do that. That is an exercise to give you an idea how your fingers, and then the pearl itself has a little bit of a indentation. And so then you feel that you're right in the middle of it, not on the sides. You know, so it's here. Where did you meet John Coltrane? Oh, gosh. Uh, the first time I met Coltrane, I guess, was with Derek. Derek introduced me to train. Back in the 50s? Or? Yeah, early 50s. Early yeah. 50s. Um, maybe 48, 49. And Harry Carney studied with you, too. Yeah. yeah. He studied bass clarinet or studied, No, he studied bass clarinet with me. And then, when he made his first solo album on baritone, he said, Joe, 
He said, uh, if I had not studied bass clarinet with you, I would never have learned to play baritone the way I did because I transferred many of the things that I did that I learned on bass clarinet. I found out that it worked much better on, on baritone. You know, so I feel like I studied baritone with you. He was a hell of a nice, a nice guy. He played in Duke Ellington's band. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so that I never asked for lessons. There was Lyle Bowen who owned a, a studio. But most of this was just for him to take naps. And his wife wouldn't let him practice at home, so he practiced there. But then I used this little couch, and there was a bathroom right next to me, and I'd have to go to the Y for 25 cents to take a shower once a week, because I didn't have any more money than that, you know. So it was, a, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you.
every week, the magic of radio brings the music of Arturo Toscanini to millions of Americans. America has taken Toscanini to its heart, not only as a musician of unmatchable talent, but also as a champion of democracy. In his house above the Hudson River near New York, he has found a haven of freedom for his children and grandchildren. But his thoughts have never been far from his beloved Italy. that this son of a soldier of Garibaldi refused to allow his music to become the servant of tyrants. They know that 20 years ago he took his stand against the tyranny of fascism in his own land. When the fascists rose to power in Germany, Toscanini withdrew from Beirut. When Austria was forced into the Reich, Toscanini was heard no more at Salzburg. And when the night of fascism darkened most of continental Europe, he brought his music and his democratic faith to the new world. He was not alone. Other Italians who preferred exile to slavery were carrying on the fight in America. Gaetano Salvemini, the historian, lectured to young Americans in the classrooms of Harvard University. G.A. Borghese at the University of Chicago taught American boys and girls to understand and love Italian literature. And some kept the dream of a free Italy alive through the press. In New York, Giuseppe Lucas, Aurelio Natolo, Carlo Aprato fought fascism with their pens. So did Colonel Randolfo Pacciardi, soldier and editor. Don Stuzzo, priest and patriot, preached democracy and the Christian ideal from his refuge in Florida. For 20 years, these men had waited, fought, and hoped. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Rome, July 25th. The first of the Axis tyrants has been deposed. Benito Mussolini has been removed as dictator of Italy. Italy has thrown off the fascist yoke and is free at last of the tyranny which has betrayed and enslaved her. This is the day for which millions of Americans of Italian descent have been waiting. This is the day. Arturo Toscanini had his answer ready. And his answer was music. of the nation, music not for Italy alone, but for all the nations united in freedom. The maestro himself edited Verdi's score to honor the great free allies of today. At the broadcasting studio, they prepared to put the great music on the air for the American tenor John Pierce, the soloist, the Westminster College Choir, the NBC Symphony Orchestra. Verdi composed the hymn to celebrate Italy's struggle to free herself from foreign domination. It was performed at the International Exposition in London in 1862. Arturo Toscanini had last conducted it in Italy in 1915 during another war forced on civilization by the German militaries. Now from New York, the music went out to celebrate Italy's new renaissance in freedom. <laughs> 